please visit sleephappia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, we are the American Sleep Apnea Association, sleepapnea.org, and we are really excited to be able to present on this topic this evening on central sleep apnea in our community. Uh, whenever we talk about apnea, we always have uh, questions uh, that come up about central sleep apnea. So we are excited to have uh, these two experts join us and a central sleep apnea patient to talk about um, the the type of apnea, the difference that it is between uh, CSA, central sleep apnea, and uh, OSA, and the different types of treatment pathways that are there. Uh, so we're excited to have um, Dr. Robin Germany join us. She uh, is a cardiologist and the Respicardia Chief Medical Officer. Say hello, Robin, so everyone can see it. There she is. Hi. <laughs> uh, this evening, we also have Dr. Kara Dupuy. She is a pulmonologist and joining us from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Say hello. She's waving. Wonderful. And then we have central sleep apnea patient Mike Dingledine, uh, resident of Ohio, joining us here to talk about from the patient perspective. So I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us this evening to talk about this lesser known form of sleep apnea, but that is consistently coming up in our community. So we are very happy uh, for your support and lending your uh, time uh, today as experts and as a patient to, to talk to our community. Um, so I'm just going to take a second and stop this share. So uh, Mike can go ahead and kick us off and tell us a little bit about your sleep apnea journey. Uh, what it was like, what happened, how did you get started with the whole thing, how did you find out you had central sleep apnea, um, because we hear that a lot from, from our other patients in our community, so go ahead and, and take it away. Right. Well, thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, it was early 2017 when it came to a point where I knew something was wrong and I knew something had to be done. Um, I wasn't sleeping, wasn't sleeping well at all. I'd wake up a half dozen or more times a night. Um, I never felt like I was getting any restful sleep. Um, I was tired all the time, fatigued, um, didn't really feel like doing anything. Uh, just It was just it was a down feeling and I knew it had been going on. I was kind of hiding it, thinking, oh, it's gonna get better, it's gonna go away, but it wasn't going away. So finally, one day I, I sat down and I, I talked to my wife about it. And I told her what I was what I was experiencing, how I was feeling and everything. And, and I got to give credit to her because she suggested, she said, well, go to the doctor, make a, make a doctor's appointment and tell them that, you know, I, I can't do anything, you know, you need to tell them. So I did that, I made an appointment. And I went in and I told my family doctor what was, what was going on, how I was feeling and, uh, they, they suggested a couple of things. One, they wanted to do some routine blood work, but also they wanted to go a step further. And they said, well, they said, we'd like to do a sleep study and uh, see what we find out there. So, okay. So I did that. We did the blood work and came time for the sleep study. And, and I went in and I participated in that study. And I, uh, I told the, asked the technician, the sleep technician afterwards, I said, well, how'd I do? You know, it's like, well, I'm all wired up. How'd I do? And he said, well, he said, you, you had a few episodes. And I said, well, what's an episode? He said, well, I said, just understand that I'm really not in a position where I can divulge any of this information to you. He said, I have to get my report together. I'll get it to your doctor and they'll contact you for an appointment. I said, okay. So when that time came and I went and I talked to my doctor, of course, I wanted to hear what these few episodes were that I was having. Well, he said, uh, those episodes, he said, you were stopping breathing on an average of 52 times an hour. He said, um, that classifies you as severe sleep apnea, 52 times. So we discussed a little bit about what was going on and everything. And his suggestion was to 
the CPAP machine. Let's let's try you out the CPAP machine. So we went that route, and um, he set it up for the initial settings and so forth. And I tried that, but it it didn't seem to be doing anything for me. And and we tried three different masks. I tried different settings. Uh, you know, it just it didn't just seem to be helping. I wanted to ask you a quick, just a quick question. Were, were, did you feel like you were able to use the CPAP machine? Like you were, you know, you could wear it most of the night, most of the days, um, and it just still wasn't really helping anything or were you unsuccessful in the, in trying to use it? Like all uh, night long? My first thought was how does anybody sleep with something strapped to their head? Okay. Um, second of all, no, it, uh, I, I, I move at night. And um, next thing I know, I'd had air blowing in my eye, you know, or whatever, waking me up, and I'd I'd be readjusting it, and and then my mouth would drop open. So they suggest, okay, now you have to wear a strap to keep your keep your jaw closed, you know, and things like that. So it it just wasn't working. And and when I was able to wear it for a, for a number of hours through the night, um, when I'd wake up in the morning, I still never felt that I slept. Didn't feel rested, and um, uh, oftentimes, I'd be two or three hours into the night. I'd, I'd take it off, and just say the heck with it. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'll be okay without this thing. But I knew that in order to do this, this is what I've been diagnosed with. That I needed to, to do this. This was going to help me. So I kept trying and trying. Um, time went on, and I struggled with that for two and a half years. In uh, the summer of 2019. Um, I listened to a radio station and they were talking about uh, a device for sleep apnea that uh, you push this button and it turns on and, you know, it takes care of this and takes care of that. And so I looked, listened and it was, a, it was a product called Inspire. And, and uh, so I started researching that a little bit. And the next time I had an appointment with my sleep physician, I mentioned to him about this and I had went to, I'm in Ohio. And I went to their website, Inspire's website, to find a doctor. And there was a doctor that at Ohio State, which is a couple hours from me, but I, I thought highly of the doctors at Ohio State. And so I thought, well, I'll try that. So I talked to my sleep physician about that, thought it was a good idea, thought I'd be a good candidate for that, and suggested that uh, in the, to his assistants to forward my records to the doctor that I had chosen. So when the time came and I went to meet with that doctor, um, I went in, Dr. Chu at Ohio State, and he came in and introduced, introduced himself to me and his assistant. We talked briefly, and then he went over to a whiteboard. And on that whiteboard, he wrote OMC. Well, I still don't know what OMC stands for, but he wrote zero on under the O, four under the M, and all the rest, and I don't recall the number, I apologize for that, but that was under C. I said, okay, so what, what's that mean? Well, he said, you have zero obstructive. He said, you have four mixed and you're all central. He said, you are, you're all central. Well, and I that was the, from your original sleep study. I mean, the, you, the records that you had transferred in, over. Correct, in 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had this dumbfounded look on my face and he said, you act like you've never heard this before. And I said, well, I, I haven't. I said, I thought sleep apnea was sleep apnea. Oh, no. He said, there's obstructive and there's central. And he said, you, you have zero obstructive. He said, you're all central. And uh, so, okay. And he said, so, he said, uh, I've got bad news for you. And he said, I've got, I've got good news for you. So I'm wondering, what's that? Okay. And for those of the attendees that were here in the beginning, that's my cue <laughs> to bring up the slides. Good job. Good job, Mike. Um, you know, I think that, you know, a lot in our community struggle with the CPAP machine as you did. And, and you know, they, they um, you know, I, I, get, I commend you a lot for trying to stick with it and, and trying to use the therapy and thinking to yourself, knowing that you still needed to you know, it was a condition that you needed to address and that you just weren't giving up because I think that's also an important part of your story because, you know, um, sleep is so important to your overall well-being and your health and, and 
it is, you know, it is a little difficult, some of the therapies uh, uh, for sleep apnea, but um, I commend you for, for sticking with it and, and giving it a good try and seeking out other answers because that's what a lot in our community are trying to do. So, all right. All right, so let me get the PowerPoint up here and then we will go ahead and lead off with Dr. Germany. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks again for, uh, for joining us this evening. And thanks, Mike, for sharing your story. Um, unfortunately, we, we hear this um, fairly commonly um, from our central patients. Central is a more rare type of sleep apnea. And it actually is a, is a completely different disorder than obstructive. So in obstructive sleep apnea, there's a blockage somewhere in the, uh, usually in the lower airway, but sometimes even in the upper airway that, that blocks airflow. So patients try to breathe, you know, they may snore, they typically will, you know, kind of jerk themselves awake and then take a deep breath. Central sleep apnea is really a fundamentally different disease. Patients just quietly stop breathing. And in fact, um, although about half the patients may report they snore, what they actually hear are these really deep breaths that come um, when the patient basically tries to catch up breathing. So there's long pauses in breathing, um, at least 10 seconds, but sometimes as long as say 45 seconds, followed by periods of really rapid, deep breathing um, that sometimes can, you know, our bed partners can say, or you snore, but that's that's not really the case. Yeah, we have um, a video on our website that 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 is that that big silence and then that huge intake that you know that someone's doing with with trying to catch their breath in their air while they're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And the the arousals even the the uh, going to a lighter stage of sleep actually occurs in central sleep apnea during the middle of that kind of rapid catch up. So, um, you know, just a really different disease. The causes of it tend to be associated um, with two types of disorders. So, so one is a disorder that causes um, a lot of high levels of norepinephrine or adrenaline. These are typically cardiac type diseases like heart failure or atrial fibrillation or renal disease. Those can be sort of the trigger of central sleep apnea. The other is that it can come from the brain itself. So you could have, um, for example, a stroke or even a genetic form of the disease that comes um, from, from an actual damage in the brain where the brain kind of forgets to tell you to breathe. Those two types look a little different on the sleep study, but they're both called central sleep apnea. And just because I know we have a, a pretty large audience here today, Central sleep apnea that's associated with heart failure or sometimes even with atrial fibrillation is often called Shane Stokes respiration, which is a specific pattern of breathing that occurs in heart patients with central sleep apnea. But fundamentally, patients just stop breathing. And, you know, obviously, if you stop breathing for 45 seconds, that can cause uh, some stress on the body. Yeah, we have uh, we often hear in the community that it's uh, more focused on, you know, where your brain is forgetting or, you know, mm -hmm. telling, get, telling you to breathe. So it's nice to, you know, get some more information in regards to um, the cardiac aspect of it as, as well. That's important to, to know the difference between those two. And so this is just a picture. So when your brain is sending a signal to your body to breathe, those signals come from a part of the brain called the respiratory control center. And they send those signals down to several different breathing muscles, including upper airway muscles and intercostal. But the main breathing muscle is the diaphragm. You can see it here. If you take a big deep breath, you can actually feel that's what you feel come down. Um, so everybody take a big deep breath. It's good for you anyway. <laughs> and uh, that's what you're feeling. You're feeling that diaphragm contract. And in central sleep apnea, there's a delay in the signals coming down from, from the brain so that, uh, so that you just stop breathing. And that's really driven by some of the blood gases that occur overnight um, in the cardiac patients. That signal just gets delayed almost like a thermostat 
So if you think of, um, if you have a bad thermostat, you're always either too hot or too cold. And in central sleep apnea, you're either not breathing or you're breathing too fast. And that's, that repeats again and again over the course of the night. We have also talked about in the past um, that, you know, with, you know, when this diagram is, is perfect because it's showing, you know, how everything is in your body. And when you're not breathing and holding your breath, you're actually making, putting pressure on your heart, you know, and kind of in all, all of that area in there. And so it's, you know, it's taxing all of these other organs besides the fact that you're not breathing and not getting oxygen and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, most of us don't think about all of those things during the day, but, you know, uh, everything has its little space in our body. And when it's something is not working or stops working, you know, it affects everything else around it. That's right. The pressures from the heart change, you know, your, your hormone levels change. Some of those things are very well documented. Um, and, and some we know a little bit more in obstructive than we do in central. Mm -hmm. And so with each of these episodes, so this is just sort of a, a diagram of what happened. So again, many of you have heard this from the obstructive literature as well, that each episode is like a discrete event. So you, there, there's a stop of breathing, the oxygen level drops, start breathing, and there's an arousal from sleep. That doesn't mean that every single time you wake up completely from sleep, but you go to a lighter stage of sleep. And that lighter stage of sleep actually is related with surges of norepinephrine or adrenaline is what you know, we typically would think of it as. And that then can cause some long-term downstream effects. It can cause um, obviously poor sleep um, and, and you know trouble thinking. We all know what it's like to be pretty tired. Um, and this happens every night. And typically with central sleep apnea, it, it doesn't happen very often that it occurs in a mild form. Um, typically once this pattern starts, it goes on and on throughout the course of the night, um, you know, hundreds of times an hour. So, you know, average patient um, might have 45 events per hour. So if you think of eight hours, then, you know, really tons of these events. And then each of those can cause sort of damage by um, we, ischemia or lack of oxygen or increasing inflammation. And that then causes overall sort of stress on the body just called increased sympathetic drive, that kind of anxiousness that maybe you feel um, is related to hormone production in the body. We know now that that hormone production can be actually the trigger for central sleep apnea. So the disease itself sort of perpetuates itself because each event can kind of worsen this, this pathway to cause more and more events. And that's why once you start this during the course of a night, just goes on unabated. So are you saying like a, like a little bit more, you know, your brain is, is not only monitoring your, your, the functions of your body, but also, you know, producing some chemicals and all this other kind of stuff. So that's what you're saying that it has a trigger from that perspective as well. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. So each time that there's um, a, la a low oxygen level, that really causes some hormones to be released that can trigger things like inflammation, or obviously you can get low oxygen levels. But in addition, that rapid deep breathing, those arousals from sleep have a measurable effect on the hormones in the body. Now, everybody has arousals. So especially, you know, once we get to my age, um, you know, we all have multiple arousals over the course of the night. The patients with both obstructive and central sleep apnea have a lot more, and, and you can measure those surges um, in the body with each one of those events. So we, we think of it as each one of those events is something we'd like to ideally get rid of. Okay. Um, but uh, Dr. Dupuy, before we head to you, I wanted to just ask Dr. Germany one, one other question. Um, I, we did have an episode on um, UARS, upper airway resistance mm -hmm. syndrome, and um, it was interesting because the, uh, the doctors there were talking about how, you know, it doesn't really present 
on a sleep study like OSA would. But you know, from from you know working with Mike, giving his um, uh, his history and about you know seeing the the doctor at Ohio State, that is something that is that a, a, a sleep study shows is the obstructive and the central. So it's 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 capturing both of those those there. So it's not. I mean, shall I say, you know, difficult to to see or find, you know, maybe as some other type? Um, that's a great question. So for an in-lab study that's done, um, you know, in a great lab like Dr. Dupuy has, um, they're definitely going to be able to tell the difference between the obstructive and the central sleep apnea. Um, but some of the home studies, for, um, and especially a pulse oximeter, may not be able to distinguish between obstructive and central sleep apnea. So sometimes, you know, patients that have a really high risk for having central sleep apnea, patients with heart failure, um, you know, persistent atrial fibrillation, those patients typically would get studied um, by either a more sophisticated home study or in an in-lab study. Um, but occasionally patients um, have CSA that, that aren't suspected. And so sometimes it's not found until they're actually put on other therapies. And I, I think Dr. Dupuy can, can talk to that as she talks to the treatments. Great. And we'll hand it over to you. Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Can you hear me okay? We hear you great. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, just as Robin said, um, central sleep apnea, you know, you have a, a better chance of diagnosing it when you're in a sleep lab and you're all wired up. I've definitely been burned before by giving someone a home sleep apnea test who I thought just had run of the mill obstructive sleep apnea. And then you find out later on down the line when the treatment doesn't work that you prescribed that, oh, it was actually central. So um, the home sleep apnea tests, um, some of them are definitely lacking in the ability to detect central sleep apnea. So unfortunately, sometimes you can get surprised. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the possible treatments for central sleep apnea. A lot of times when we're treating obstructive sleep apnea, you know, in many cases, it's pretty straightforward. Um, CPAP works most of the time, but the same thing is not true for central sleep apnea. It's actually much more difficult and can be pretty frustrating to treat. And part of the reason for that is that there is no universal one size fits all treatment. Um, people with can have central sleep apnea for different reasons. And um, so there can be, you know, very different types of patients who have this disease. And so one treatment that might work great for one type of patient might not work well at all for another type of patient. And you don't necessarily know what treatment is going to work ahead of time. And sometimes there's a lot of trial and error. Um, so the first go-to treatment that we typically try is CPAP. And I think that's more by just convention and because that's what insurance prefers that you do because CPAP is a pretty ineffective treatment for central sleep apnea and oftentimes actually makes it worse. Um, if you look at research that's been done, some of the studies say that it works about 50% of the time, but based on my personal experience, that number is much, much lower than 50%. I can't say that I've ever seen someone with you know, true and pure central sleep apnea that has responded well to CPAP. Um, so when CPAP doesn't work, sometimes we will try a bi-level PAP. So CPAP is a continuous positive airway pressure. It pressurizes the airway and it gives you just one pressure the whole night. Its only job is to hold your airway open with that air pressure. Whereas a bi-level device has two different pressures. It has a higher pressure when you breathe in, a lower pressure when you breathe out. So it opens up your airway, but it also can support the breathing in various ways. Um, so when you have these breathing pauses in central sleep apnea, it can encourage you to breathe a little bit more and then, you know, kind of back off when you're in that phase where you're breathing too much. So the bi-level devices typically will work, work with you a little bit more. So the bi-level devices are usually much more successful in treating sleep apnea than a CPAP would be. And I have written on the slide here, the ASV, which is a specific type of bi-level device, which actually um, 
works well in many people um, who have central sleep apnea. Of course, there's always a catch. As I said, there's no perfect treatment. <laughs> um, unfortunately, this type of device, the ASV was studied in patients with heart failure who have an ejection fraction of less than 45%, basically just meaning that the amount of blood that your heart is pumping is significantly impaired. And in that patient population, it was shown that ASV actually caused increased mortality and they had to stop the study early. So, you know, if you have a, a normal heart and, and you have central sleep apnea, then ASV might be a great option. But if, if your heart is impaired and you have heart failure, then unfortunately we don't usually feel comfortable using ASV. And a lot of people, you might get different answers from different people about other types of bi-level PAP because there's a couple other different types. Some people feel comfortable using those in heart failure. I personally don't use um, bi-level, any type of bi-level PAP in patients with heart failure because I think that the way it works is similar enough to ASV that I still have that concern that, um, you know, it could, there could be some detriment to the patient. Right, uh, right. Okay. Okay. That's interesting, probably getting back to what we were talking about before, how everything is so closely related and, you know, all, uh, you know, right there in your body with the lungs expanding and contracting and your heart doing the same thing and trying to get air in there, force some air in there, it gets a little... Yeah, and, and that's why I, I don't think we know exactly why some of these devices are harmful for people with heart failure, but that's one of the theories is that, you know, giving these big breaths of air and expanding the lungs so much can maybe, you know, squish up against the heart and impair its function a little bit more. But I don't think we have the definitive answer yet. That's just a theory. Um, so other treatments that we have, uh, oxygen. So this would just be, you know, putting an oxygen tank in your house next to your bed and, uh, you know, the little prongs that go in your nose that you might use when you're in the hospital, wear that at night when you go to sleep and give uh, a, a little oxygen flow at night. Sometimes this can work wonders. I have seen um, patients who, you know, you, they have horrible central sleep apnea, you give them a little bit of oxygen and it just melts away. And then there's other patients who you give them oxygen and it does absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll raise the oxygen level, but it doesn't necessarily take away those breathing pauses, which mm -hmm. ideally is what we're looking to do. So um, the other thing about oxygen is that we don't have a lot of data about it in research. So while it works really well for some people, and I've had patients tell me that, that, you know, the oxygen has made a huge difference and they feel fantastic. We don't have any research saying, you know, if it improves quality of life, if it has any benefit on the heart function, we don't know if it impacts mortality, you know, if it makes people live longer, um, there's just not a lot that is known about the long-term outcomes of oxygen therapy, um, but appropriate for some people. <laughs> and then the last thing, or not the last thing, but uh, the last uh, non-invasive treatment for sleep apnea or for central sleep apnea that we really have are medications. Um, just two medications have been studied for central sleep apnea. One is theophylline, which is a medication that they actually sometimes use in patients with lung disease and it stimulates breathing. Theophylline has a lot of side effects and a lot of medication interactions and the um, level, you have to keep it in a really tight range or else it can be dangerous actually. And so this is a medication that a lot of people are really hesitant to use, especially in our older patients with heart failure and other um, health problems, especially if they're on a lot of medications. So um, I've personally never used theophylline with any of my patients because it just has, um, it's just kind of a scary medication to use because of all the side effects. Um, and then same thing with theophylline, you know, it does work, work to decrease the amount of breathing pauses per hour in central sleep apnea, but we don't have any data on whether it's helpful to the heart, whether it improves the way that people feel, um, or anything about mortality or anything like that. Acetazolamide is uh, a diuretic or a water pill. Uh, so it has less side effects than the theophylline, but of course, it still does have side effects and other medication interactions. 
it does work to lower the amount of breathing pauses that you get with central sleep apnea, but similar to theophylline, we don't know anything about long-term outcomes or there's no research about it making people feel better or live longer, or, um, you know, have a positive impact on the heart or anything like that. So that has its limitations too. Right. Were these um, pharmacological options uh, developed specifically for central sleep apnea or were they for something else? Because sometimes, you know, medications start off in one area of, of medicine and then they kind of you know, people find out through research and whatever that it kind of helps over here too. Yeah. Um, no, these were not de developed for central sleep apnea. These are, these are both pretty old medications, um, especially theophylline that's been around forever. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, I, I am not sure exactly the history of how it was discovered that these were helpful for central sleep apnea, but I'm fairly positive that that was not the original intent of these medications. Okay. If I, uh, there's a couple of questions here. I think this might be a good Jeffrey asked, cause you were talking about oxygen. Um, I think we should just revisit this really quick. You know, would, you know, just using oxygen, won't that be helpful? You know, if I'm, if I'm not breathing. Um, and I think you were kind of saying it depends, it depends on the person. So I'll go yep. ahead and let you. Yeah. So sometimes, um, you know, as Robin was explaining, a lot of what causes central sleep apnea is um, signals that the brain receives about the level of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body. And then, you know, so for example, your brain might sense that you have a low oxygen level and say, oh gosh, I have to breathe a bunch, you know, take a bunch of really deep breaths. And then your brain says, oh no, I overdid it. And then there's a breathing pause. And then the oxygen level drifts back down. And then your brain's like, oh wait, the oxygen's low again. And then breathes a bunch and then, you know, overdoes it. So um, sometimes if you give a little bit of oxygen, so I guess um, once you get into that dysfunctional pattern of breathing, it's hard for your brain to get things back on track. And that's why we don't really see mild central sleep apnea. A lot of times it's just central sleep apnea, you know, the whole night, because it's hard to get out of that pattern. But sometimes oxygen can take away that first stimulus to have to, you know, to, to drive that increased breathing. And so it can stop that pat pattern in certain people. Um, but, you know, everyone has a little bit different uh, sensitivity to the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so for some people, giving them oxygen will just take away that, that first um, dysfunctional breathing uh, pattern kickoff and, you know, keep you good for the whole night. And some people, it just doesn't work. Right. And there is some advantage. Um, sometimes if you're having all these breathing pauses and your oxygen's going really low, you know, there is some advantage to raising the oxygen level up, but um, the consequences to the heart are not just from the oxygen level. Some of it is from the breathing pause itself and these wake-ups that you get as a result. So simply raising the oxygen is not usually enough to, um, you know, to take away the whole problem. Right. And so um, can, can we just revisit, because we also had a question from Karen about, you know, mild CSA. Um, um, often with the obstructive sleep apnea uh, um, community, you know, people say mild, moderate, severe. Is is it similar? And this is to you or, or Dr. German, whoever, you know, is, is comfortable answering. Is is there this different levels, you know, that in, uh, in a patient, an individual can be in in regards to? Yeah, I mean, you 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 can classify it like that, but Whereas in obstructive sleep apnea, there's a lot of research about, you know, this many breathing pauses per hour causes this cardiovascular risk, you know, and in central sleep apnea, we, it's just not that way. We don't have the level of detail about, you know, how many breathing pauses per hour is going to cause what sort of, um, you know, health consequence. Um, and so it, it's just a little bit uh, of, a, of a gray area, you know, and it, it's harder to make these distinct distinctions, you know, because in, in obstructive sleep apnea, you say, well, if it's in the mild range, you know, we don't associate, associate that with heart failure and, you know, things like that. But we don't really have that in central sleep apnea. So um, 
you kind of have to take into account too the reason why the patient has a central sleep apnea. You know, do they have really bad heart failure? You know, is it coming from a medication that they're taking? Um, and then one thing that I always look at too is how much of a problem that it's causing with the oxygen, because if it's causing a big oxygen problem and the patient is spending a lot of time at low oxygen levels, then that is another thing that makes me really want to work to treat it. So I don't know if Robin has any, or Dr. Germany has any other thoughts. No, I thought you did a great job there. <laughs> okay. Um, so this brings us to uh, phrenic nerve stimulation, which is another treatment option for central sleep apnea. So this is actually a device that gets implanted underneath the skin. And then there is a wire that goes through one of the main blood vessels and travels to where the phrenic nerve is, which is the nerve that stimulates the diaphragm to breathe. And um, this uh, implant sends stimulation to the nerve so that the diaphragm comes down and you take a breath. Um, so, you know, whereas uh, like a BiPAP would give you a breath with positive pressure, this takes that pressure aspect out of it and just causes the diaphragm to contract and create a breath in that way. But the concept is kind of... I was just going to say, and since there's no obstruction by lowering it, it you're, you're then inhaling. Is what's yeah, exactly. It's creating a little bit of a vacuum and you're inhaling and you don't have anything going on with your nose or in your throat. So it's mm -hmm. just those functioning. Correct. Yep, exactly. So when you're having, you know, one of these breathing pauses, it can stimulate you to take a breath. And then when you're, you know, not having the breathing pause, it can kind of back off um, and help to smooth out that breathing. And this product, um, you know, I mentioned before that sometimes patients with heart failure and, and reduced heart function, it's hard to find a good treatment for them because all you really have is oxygen and medications and that's, that doesn't work for everybody. Um, so this is a, another good option for someone, especially who has you know, heart failure, they can't use a bi-level PAP device, you know, oxygen and medications haven't worked as they don't in many people. And um, this has been shown to increase quality of life and make patients feel better, which is important in addition to treating the central sleep apnea and um, you know, might al also have some positive uh, impacts on, on the heart function as well. Great, great. No, I mean, there's, there's, there's innovation um, coming all the time in all areas of, of apnea. I mean, now they're moving towards with, you know, helping uh, masks, as, as Mike was saying before, are uh, a big issue for the CPAP machines. And now they're kind of moving towards, you know, helping, taking pictures of your face, finding the best mask for you, so on and so forth. Different um, pharmaceuticals are coming up, you know, as you, you know, even though those older, those are older medications that you were talking about before there's still some other things you know in the work and then you know in the last uh, several years the implant devices that that are coming up for a variety of uh of, of treatment options so you know things are things are changing which is good to be able to give patients you know some some options in uh in in their treatment yeah and i think it's especially important for central sleep apnea because there's such a wide variety of reasons that people have central sleep apnea and so we really need a wide variety of treatments because um you know it, it's just not one size fits all it's a very diverse population of patients yeah yeah so i think um we're gonna go back to mike mike are you there i am i'm gonna go through these two slides here and then I'm going to bring you back and hopefully you're there. There you are. Okay. So thank you doctors for your information. We have a lot of questions. I'm trying to like go through them all. We'll, we'll get some of them more and more of them at the end, but we'll let Mike pick up his, uh, you know, patient story from he's, he's at the doctor at Ohio state, right? This is where you found out you had central sleep apnea versus some other type. And um, where did it go from there? Did you try uh, uh, an ASV machine or a BiPAP or how did that go? Okay, well, Dr. Chu said that he had bad news for me and he had good news for me. Uh, unfortunately, his bad news was he said, I can't help you. 
because I had been there to check out Inspire. He said, Inspire is only for obstructive sleep apnea. It won't do you any good. He said, you, you're all central. He said, so I, I can't help you. Hey, but he said, I do have a colleague here at Ohio State, Dr. Augustini, that works with central sleep apnea. And I think he might have something that would, would help you. He said, so if you would like, we'll forward your records to him and uh, they'll contact you and set up an appointment. So it all sounded good to me. So we went home, waited for a call. A couple weeks later, we got a call. They set up an appointment. And I went in and met with uh, Dr. Augustini's assistant, Julie Meese. And she explained a little bit to me about what was going on with my central sleep apnea. And um, she mentioned a device called the Remedy System. And she explained to me a little bit about what that was. And and everything and asked me my interest in that. And I thought, well, this is, uh, this is finally what I, I think I'm looking for. I said, I said, if this is right, this is a no brainer. And I said, so what do I need to do? And she said, well, the first thing we'd like to do is do more recent sleep study. She said, your sleep study was 2017. We would like to have a current sleep study just to make sure that you meet the criteria for the remedy system and so forth. So we agreed to do that. I underwent the sleep study, and now my um, episodes went from 52 an hour to 57 an hour. So in that three years almost, it had progressively gotten worse. So based on that and what we had discussed, I said, I think, I think we want to proceed. So what do we do now? Well, she said, well, take your insurance information, and we'll, we'll file that with the insurance company and make sure that you know it's all taken care of or whatever. And we'll let you know. So just go home and you'll hear from us. So it's about three weeks later and uh, hearing from others, it, unfortunate, it only took three weeks, but um, they said, okay, you've been approved for this and we've scheduled you for January 9th of next year, which was last year, 2020. Okay. So what do I have to do? Show up. That's all you have to do. Okay. Just, did you use a, did you use a therapy in between? I mean, cause obviously you had to wait a while. You, um, did you try to stick a little bit with the CPAP or I, anything? I still had my CPAP, but what I understood her to say and what I found out later that the CPAP machine doesn't communicate with your brain and your CPAP machine isn't telling your brain to tell you to breathe. So it was kind of yeah, whatever. You can keep trying it if you want, but you, know, it's, it's, you don't have to. You do what you want to do. So I, I tried it for a little bit and then... No, I thought, well, we're going to go to this other route. We're going to go with the remedy system. So on January 9th, I went in. It was an outpatient surgery. Um, I was there at 6 o'clock in the morning. The operation took place about 7.30. And by 4 o'clock, I was back in the car heading home. Uh, it went, I thought it went well. Um, it, it was not turned on yet. That would be four to six weeks later. It had to heal. But in the meantime, it was collecting data on how I was sleeping, how I was positioned, right, left, back, whatever, what time I went to bed. It was collecting all this data. So I went back on February 24th of last year, and they activated it. And um, I've been back several times since then. And they, they optimize it, tweak it, whatever you want, tune it up, whatever you want to call it. I don't know the professional term for it, but... Um, so each time tune, up, it, tune up's the professional term. <laughs> yeah, each time it was with the understanding that um, it was meant to ramp up the settings a little bit to give me a nice fuller breath of air. And um, so it, it's worked great. At least I can speak for myself. I can't speak for everyone. Um, I feel better. I sleep. Um, I enjoy doing things. I like to try things. Um, I, uh, I, I, this is kind of my own diagnosis, but I think this central sleep apnea or sleep apnea in itself is both physically draining and mentally draining, because if you're not sleeping, you're not feeling well, it works on your brain that, you know, it, it just, it just gets back and forth, back and forth. It's just tiring. But I, but I haven't had that feeling of speaking to someone the other day and I, I took it for granted. I'm dreaming now, whereas before I never fell asleep long enough to have a dream. And now I'm dreaming. And you're, so you're getting that deeper sleep. And uh, so I, it just, it's, it's been a life changer for me. Uh, 
I, I feel. Well, let, let me say, I mean, your, your, your talk about, you know, how it is, affects you physically and mentally interrupted sleep. We talk about that all the time with our community. I mean, I think, you know, anytime that your, your sleep is interrupted for a long periods, you know, it affects your mood, happiness, you know, everything, you know, uh, uh, whether or not you, you kind of get, you know, um, frustrated quickly, what have you, you know, there's all that other aspects, uh, like you said, to it as well, besides just, you know, being tired or maybe, you know, just fatigued and feel like you need naps and not being rested. There is all of those other components of it. So I want to thank you for, for sharing your, your story with us. And I'm sure there's some questions here that'll come, that will come up uh, for you as well, Mike. But um, I, there's, there's an interesting question here from Jeffrey in regards to central sleep apnea and um, preparing for uh, surgery. Um, you know, taking into consideration, we've talked about this in our in our community as well. Um, you know, talking if you're having surgery for whatever reason and have a type of apnea or central sleep apnea, of communicating that with with your physician, um, Dr. Germany. Do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of of that? Yeah, and I'll let um, Dr. Dapui uh, weigh in as well. You know, I. I think this is often, I, I was with a physician today who said, this is how he diagnoses it, that he sedates his patients and then he can see them stop breathing with just very mild sedation and that's it. I, I, I told him, I hope he tests them before, <laughs> but, but he said, it's really obvious to see that these patients, and that is a little scary, you know, in a lot of cardiac procedures, we use mild sedation. And if, if, if people aren't aware ahead of time that you have either obstructive or central and you're undergoing a mild or moderate sedation without an anesthesiologist there, um, that's, that can be a little more complex. So I do think it's really important um, that your physician, whoever's going to give you um, anesthesia, knows about your sleep history. And, and I, don't, I assume you guys probably have a protocol, right, Dr. Dupuy? Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Uh, um, well, yeah, we, we do. It depends on, um, the nature of the surgery. I mean, everyone who's referred for bariatric surgery, for instance, has to have a, a sleep evaluation because the instance of sleep disordered breathing is so high. Um, and I, I guess I'm not totally familiar with, um, you know, how they decide who gets referred to us, but we definitely see a lot of, um, pre-procedural and pre-operative, um, visits. Great, great. Yeah, I think that that's really important. We we did, um, the, the American Sleep Apnea Association did a, a, a video on, you know, preparing for, for surgery. Um, I, uh, uh, Mike, we had a um, question that d since you've had uh, the uh, device um, in, uh, implanted, have you had any um, follow-up sleep studies to see how it's going? Is that part of the uh, procedure as well or the follow-up, the tune-up, so, so to speak? I had a follow-up study in October. Um, I never found out what those numbers were. Um, the next appointment I had, they said I, not, as, not the apnea events, but the hypo apnea events or whatever. Um, so they were tweaking that again to do that. I have um, next Friday, I am actually going to Columbus to pick up a sleep study machine and do it at home. Um, they, uh, I thought, you know, if, if I was doing a home sleep study that I could go to the local hospital and get one. They said no, that they had machines that were specially, you know, uh, calibrated, whatever. They wanted me to use their machine. So I'm driving to Columbus, picking up a machine, learning how to hook it up, whatever and then driving back home and have to take it back on Monday. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. so I'll, I'll be doing that then. So hopefully the numbers pan out. I, I sure feel good um, as far as my sleeping. And so I hope that that, that proves out in those numbers. Great, great. There was a question here about um, neurofeedback, maybe one of the doctors, neurofeedback to retrain the brain uh, as a way to treat central sleep apnea. Is it, are either one of you familiar a little bit with that? Put you on the spot? I no, I haven't seen any literature on it. Um, it it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, there's been a little, there was a little work done 
um, in yoga breathing for patients that have daytime. Um, so for heart failure patients, this breathing pattern can actually happen even while they're awake um, for very sick patients. And there was some yoga breathing that was done for those patients and patients did better with the theory here that there's some feedback into the brain. But that's the only data that I've seen um, looking at that. So, so there, there might be a way to do it, but I, but I haven't seen any recent literature on that. Okay, okay. We had a question here about um, autonomic dysfunction. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is in central sleep apnea. Uh, so uh, yeah, so, so it's, this is, so autonomic dysfunction is a wide variety of disorders um, that can, um, for example, that, that are typically autoimmune. So there can be some gastroparesis, there can be um, some patients like when they stand up their blood pressure drops. Um, there, so typically I would say, I don't see that central sleep apnea would cause this, but there are some patients that have autonomic dysfunction from their other disorder. Um, and they, they become pretty sick over time sometimes, but thankfully not all the time. And um, I've been contacted by a couple of patients that have developed central sleep apnea, but I haven't seen any literature on that. Uh, Dr. Pui, have you seen anything? Uh, about that? No, I, I'm not familiar with any sort of strong link uh, between central sleep apnea and autonomic dysfunction. I have not seen that before. So I, I go with Dr. Germany's answer. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of questions in here where individuals are talking about using their machine and, and having leaks and, you know, and, and trying to work through, um, you know, wearing the mask and making it through the night with the machine, so on and so forth. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, you know, let all of the attendees know that um, the American Sleep Apnea Association has a free over the phone uh, peer to peer support program. So um, you are, um, you join the program and, um, and then you get set up with a peer mentor who you talk with over the phone that can help you with all of these different types of things going on with your machine. So, you know, leaks and, and, and gurgling and, and what all these buttons do on my, you know, my machine and changing the humidity and all that type of stuff. So if you're having issues actually, you know, with the, the one of the PAP devices, um, we can help get you a peer mentor that um, can help you work through that because we all know with COVID, even though you are seeing more patients in the office, sometimes you're, you know, not able, to, doctors aren't able to get through all of those questions. And, you know, we find experienced mentors in our community, you know, that have been successful with their PAP therapy and can, can help you through that and can get you over those hurdles to, you know, to stick with the therapy. So hopefully that will help some out there that are that are um, working through those types of issues with their machine. Um, let me see what else we have here. Um, people talking about night sweats and heart triggers with exercises. Um, someone was here saying that um, when they started um, Prozac uh, in regards to um, working with their obstructive sleep apnea, they had had mixed, they had obstructive and, and central, that that kind of helped them with their breathing and get their central episodes down. Anything with, with that type of, uh, of medication? Any, any comments, any, okay, okay. Just throwing that out there. I have not used that in the past, but um, uh, Prozac and medications like it do alter the sleep architecture. So the proportions of REM sleep and your dreaming sleep and non-REM sleep. And um, one of the things that they do is they decrease the proportion of REM sleep. So if you are a person who has more central events during REM sleep, I suppose it would be theoretically possible to alter the amount of, of breathing pauses per hour that you're having. But this is just me uh, hypothesizing. I'm not certain of any actual literature about it. I don't know if Dr. Germany is. <laughs> sure. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and then we wanted, someone wanted to know um, with Mike, with your uh, device, is there any noticeable um, bumps or anything on, on your, I assume it's kind of up here on your upper chest area? I've been asked that question many times. And um, I, I would think that someone has to look hard to see that on your right side. Um, it is not grotesque, it does not protrude, um, none of that. And I, I use the analogy that um, children, my grandchildren, four of them, um, they see everything, they don't miss a thing. And when we went on vacation in the summertime, we go to the lake or whatever, you know, no, none of those grandchildren ever look at that and say, Grandpa, that's where you got that thing, isn't it? You know, they, they don't notice it. Now, I don't think they're just overlooking it because they notice every, they'll notice a, a, you know, a little scratch on your arm or something, but they don't notice that. It is not detectable. If I wear, you know, this shirt, you can't tell that there's anything underneath it and it's not a loose fitting shirt. So that's really not a concern. And, and even the little bit that you would know that it's there because it's in you, okay? the good far outweighs the bad. And if the bad is being able to tell where that is in you, um, you know, the good is that it's working. You know, that's, that's my thought. There's a, there's a question here in regards to CPAP use, long-term CPAP use um, causing central sleep apnea. You know, maybe bringing me because the, the machine is, I guess, kind of, you know, helping you all night long. And so your brain maybe is relaxing a little bit and saying, hey, I don't have to do these things anymore. Got some help here. Um, certainly that can happen. Um, and you probably have seen that some more often in your clinic than, than we see patients with that. Yeah. So um, the data on treatment emergent central sleep apnea. Um, so, you know, people who have obstructive sleep apnea and they start on CPAP and then they develop central sleep apnea. The theory or one of the theories on why that happens is that maybe these people are, are a little bit more sensitive to, you know, the changes in, in carbon dioxide that in oxygen that come with initiating CPAP and that kind of sets them off on that course of dysfunctional breathing. Um, Central treatment emergent central sleep apnea has several different courses. For most people, it will go away on a period of weeks to months. Um, for some people, it never goes away. And then there's also another subset of people who don't have central sleep apnea when they're on CPAP at first, but then it develops later. Um, and I don't know exactly what proportion that that happens in. And I don't think that, that we know exactly why it happens either. Um, but there are a lot of cases too, you know, if you've been on CPAP for a long time, you know, you're living your life, other things are happening. And I've definitely seen many patients who, um, you know, maybe they developed AFib and now they have central sleep apnea while they're on their CPAP or they develop heart failure. And now, you know, so something else happens with their health. I don't know that I would say that the CPAP is giving you the central sleep apnea, but it is true that if you're very, very sensitive to these little, you know, changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide that the CPAP, you know, initiates, then, then, you know, you could develop it. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, there is a question here about, um, I'm not, I don't know what MIs are and strokes occur when sleep apnea is present and untreated. Can you explain simply, please, the mechanisms of how MIs and strokes occur when sleep apnea is present and untreated? Well, I'll take a stab and then I will uh, pass it over <laughs> to my colleague. Um, so, so each one of these episodes causes um, hypoxia. And if you already have a blockage somewhere, either in the heart, and hypoxia is just low oxygen levels, right? So if you have a blockage in your heart or in your brain and the oxygen level drops, it can drop below that critical level that would cause you to have um, a little bit of damage. Um, typically, um, these are gonna be small areas of damage, but that stress that comes from this breathing this is true for obstructive and for central sleep apnea, but these drops in oxygen associated with these bursts of, of, of uh, hormones 
can cause actually um, a plaque or a, a, a group of cholesterol to sort of break open and trigger the heart, trigger heart attack. So the body sees that as a cut and it forms a blood clot there. And so larger heart attacks are typically caused by that. And one of the things we see in sleep apnea is that these can occur um, during the course of the night because patients' oxygen is dropping and that can cause, that makes it a little easier for those, um, those plaques of cholesterol to kind of break apart and, and cause a heart attack. So I get highly suspicious if I, if I see a patient with, with heart chest pain or a heart attack um, between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. That makes me really suspicious that we need to get those patients then tested for sleep apnea. Um, and the other one they were asking, they were asking about strokes as well. Is that right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Strokes, I would say, are probably, um, you can have little tiny ones that are due to the oxygen levels. We don't see as much plaque rupture there, but um, both forms of sleep apnea are associated with atrial fibrillation or an irregular heartbeat. And that is closely tied. Um, when you have an irregular heartbeat, it can um, allow clots to form in the top chamber of the heart. And if you're not on the right medications, then that those clots can then fail and cause a stroke. So it's, a, it's, it's more of an indirect cause that it's associated with a, another heart disorder that then can trigger the strokes. I don't, I don't know, Dr. Dupuy, if you have any other mechanisms as well. Yeah, I mean, these repetitive arousals from sleep, um, you know, you have a breathing pause and then your, your brain has to wake you up with that fight or flight response or that surge of adrenaline. It's very, um, those chemicals are inflammatory and irritating to the blood vessels, you know, and, and so all of your blood vessels in your body see that it's just that, you know, the blood vessels in your brain and the blood vessels in your heart are more susceptible to damage, I think, than like, blood vessels in your finger. <laughs> um, and so, you know, all, all that repetitive inflammation and, you know, in addition, the low oxygen levels um, is what causes that, is, is the source of that risk. I'm muted. I'm talking. I'm mute. <laughs> We're coming up on almost an hour, so I'd like to just finish out with, with just maybe two more questions. Um, so... Uh, Dr. Dupuy, can you just talk for a minute about, there were some questions in here about, um, you know, AHI and, and um, oh, I, I, wanna, I hope I say it right, hypopneas, um, and kind of, you know, what, what, what's the difference between, an, I guess, an apnea event and a hypopnea and kind of, let's, let's just talk about that for, for a minute and, do, and that it's the same measurement used for OSA and CSA? Yeah, so um, the AHI is the apnea hypopnea index, and apneas and hypopneas are the two different type of breathing events that go into the diagnosis and also defining how severe um, obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea is. And so when we talk about you know breathing pauses per hour, we're kind of talking about you know apneas and hypopneas per hour. Um, Apneas have to last at least 10 seconds long. And if you're looking, you know, studying a patient on the sleep study, the airflow has to decrease by 90%. So it's pretty much a total breathing pause that lasts at least 10 seconds. If we see that the patient is continuing to try to breathe during that breathing pause, um, so, you know, you might see movement of the chest and abdomen and they're trying to breathe, but their airway is closed, so no air is moving, we know that that's an obstructive apnea. Um, if they're having this breathing pause and they're not trying to breathe, then we know that it's a central apnea because the brain isn't sending that signal to breathe. Um, and then for a hypopnea, there's a couple different definitions of hypopneas um, that are out there, but <laughs> What, what we use in our lab is that it has to be, a, again, a 10 second period where there's a reduction in airflow of at least 30%. And then that has to be associated with the oxygen going down by four percentage points. Um, and so similar to apneas, hypopneas can also be obstructive or central. It's really difficult to tell 
what is an obstructive apnea and what is a central apnea. And there is research going on right now trying to trying to look more into effective ways to differentiate central and obstructive hypopneas. So that's um, one of the things that does complicate classifying somebody as central or obstructive, but uh, but those are the two things and they're they're kind of given equal weight in that in that definition of of the AHI. So they're both important events. And let, let's let's round out with you, Dr. Germany. Um, you know, can you impress upon our audience here? You know how important it is to to get diagnosed and get on a treatment plan and find a treatment plan that works for you. How important that is to you know your overall health and well being. And yes, yeah, so I think you know sleep is so important to every aspect of our lives. And I think the more that learn and in sleep research the more we realize that that it's it's a vital to to how you think to your mood to uh to active to having a healthy heart and a healthy brain and probably a healthy like but i don't deal with that that much so um but but sleep really affects all the aspects of our lives and so making certain that you know what if you have a sleep disorder what that sleep disorder is working with a physician who's a going to listen to you and then really working to find the right treatment for you regardless of whether you have central or obstructive or or any of the variety of other sleep disorders out there is is really important and don't give up i think so often um patients have had maybe one bad experience or they saw something on tv that they didn't like and uh, and and there's new treatments coming out um for these disorders all the time so so keep keep listening. Come to places like this, and and uh, and know that that there's lots of new things on the horizon. Yes, yes. I encourage everyone here to, you know, um, if you haven't been to our website, sleepapnea.org, you know, we, as I mentioned before, we have the peer mentor program. We also have a CPAP assistance program, which we do have, um, you know, a couple handfuls of ASV machines. So if people are, you know, uh, have uh, really high deductibles or financially, uh, you know, in, in a bind to be able to get one of those machines, we're able to, to, to help with that. So there's resources out there, um, you know, and just as Mike uh, described in his, um, you know, in his story that, you know, he started off seeking one device and ended up over here on another. And, and, you know, that that's a lot of our community. And that's, you know, and that's why we're here all together talking to each other to, you know, share our stories because um, everyone's is different, but I can also guarantee that you're very similar to somebody else <laughs> that we have out there. Um, so I want to thank uh, Mike and Dr. Germany and Dr. Dupuy for joining us uh, this evening. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise and sharing your story. And thank you to uh, Respicardia for their support and in, in giving this uh, the webinar and sharing their their experts with us. So um, you know we will be in touch with all the attendees afterwards you know, send you a quick email. So if you have any other questions that we didn't get to, uh, we would be more than happy to, um, to get those answers to you. Anything else, anybody, before we call it quits? Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Me. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, we'll have this video up on, our, uh, up on our website and on our YouTube channel as well. So if you missed anything, you can go ahead and take a look at it there. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleephappia.org slash donate for details. SAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.